Okay, the next speaker is Michele Seviotti. So yesterday we already had a very nice conversation <laughs> over dinner, and so I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Uh, thanks everybody. It's like to. It's really nice to have uh, all these visitors from uh, Japan. So um, I'm actually kind of a uh, intruder. <laughs> I am. Uh, I work in a material science department, uh, and uh, you know, essentially, uh, what I'm trying to do is to uh, develop uh, modeling techniques uh, for material science. Um, but in doing so just like everybody in a, pretty much every field of science, I ended up doing a lot of machine learning. And I hope that some of these might also be relevant uh, in, a, in a more general uh, kind of setting. So uh, I want to be very clear that the type of machine learning that I intend to do is not the kind of end-to-end uh, -end predictions where you feed uh, the most uh, uh, oversimplified uh, uh, description of a physical system, and you want to predict uh, uh, what it this system will eventually do. So here I'm sort of joking on the notion that, you know, you just give the formula of alcohol and the machine learning technique will tell you that it will get you drunk. And the idea is really to use machine learning within the same uh, bottom-up modeling framework uh, that people have been using to model materials for quite some time. So basically, you would uh, start from the coordinates of the atoms, uh, predict their atomic uh, level properties, do some kind of statistical sampling, and eventually understand the mechanism by which a molecule does something to you uh, when you put it in your body. So the uh, rate limiting step in this uh, bottom up modeling is typically to solve the quantum mechanical uh, electronic structure problem for one uh, configuration of the atoms. So essentially what uh, traditionally physics based modeling would do is to start from the coordinates of the atoms, uh, set up some kind of approximation of the Schrodinger equation and predict uh, the potential energy for a given arrangement of the atoms or dipole moments, uh, Hamiltonians, uh, all sorts of uh, electronic uh, observables that you can then use uh, to predict uh, uh, the behavior of a molecule. And basically, the idea is that rather than using electronic structure theory and quantum mechanics, uh, we build uh, surrogate models uh, based on machine learning. And, and, and basically, what I want to say is that, I mean, this works beautifully. This is something which is already uh, has already become an integral part of the modeling uh, toolbox. And uh, it's nowadays it's kind of silly to do explicit uh, electronic structure calculations because you can relatively easily uh, set up a surrogate model that achieves almost the same accuracy at a thousandth of the computational cost. And so you can do things like uh, simulating uh, uh, um, spectroscopic observables for aqueous systems. So these are the kind of simulations that I actually used to do during my postdoc, and I used to write uh, CPU time grants uh, for uh, tens of millions of CPU hours, and now we can run these uh, on the local cluster, and it's, you know, the, uh, the electronic structure side of this is not even the point of the paper. Uh, we can do simulations on large scale systems, uh, simulate uh, phase transitions uh, in amorphous silicon. Uh, we can simulate, uh, we are now pushing this idea of integrated models in which we don't only predict the energetics uh, of a configuration, but also uh, all sorts of functional properties. So for example, here we simulated uh, uh, transitions in barium titanate, which is a ferroelectric material, and we can also simulate the dielectric properties. Again, these are simulations that used to be horribly time consuming. So, you know, many people uh, uh, complain that machine learning is very environmentally unfriendly, but we're actually saving a ton of CO2 by using machine learning rather than quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is worse than machine learning. So, uh, you know, Beside this uh, um, sort of uh, application uh, goal, which is eventually, you know, I'm in a material science department, this is what uh, I'm paid to do, uh, I always very much like uh, uh, trying to rationalize and formalize stuff. And when it comes to the machine learning techniques that are applied to materials and chemistry, it's really a mess. Uh, I edit for a, a journal in chemical physics uh, and uh, Every week I receive a couple of papers uh, that propose uh, a new method uh, to do machine learning for chemistry. And this is just from last year, and it's basically sort of a, a family tree of descriptors uh, that are used uh, to perform these molecular tasks. And this is a selection. This is, you know, <laughs> selected few that have been uh, 
used quite broadly. And so when I look at these, uh, I don't think it's satisfactory because it's nice to have a lot of varieties, nice to have options, but it would be nice to understand if all of these methods really do something new or they are all doing the same thing uh, with different names. And more in general, personally, I find that machine learning uh, has a bit of a branding uh, problem. So uh, you, you, know, you, you typically see uh, models pushed and uh, advertised, and these models, uh, I, I, I compare them to pre-mixed drinks. They make a lot of choices about the training set, about the training strategy, about the inference method. And, and then, you know, you, you take it and you drink it, and it's kind of okay, you know, it does, does its job. But I, I have kind of this ambition of trying to understand what are the ingredients that go into the construction of a machine learning model, and specifically for chemistry and materials, with the idea that, you know, you can guess where this is going, you know, you can mix your own and, and pick your poison, which is kind of more interesting than just getting something off the shelf. So, uh, in this context, we have been sort of trying to rationalize the construction of specifically representations of molecules for machine learning. And of course, at the end of the day, this is pretty much the same as representations for point clouds, because the way we regard atoms as the input for quantum calculation is basically a bunch of points that are the coordinates of the atoms labeled with the chemical nature. We have an oxygen, we have a carbon, we have a hydrogen. And so basically, you can regard molecules and materials as the input of one of these surrogate models as a point cloud or as a geometrically decorated graph. So basically, alternatively, you can also look at that molecule as the set of relationships between pairs of atoms. Um, and so this is basically, you know, goes very naturally into a graph representation of molecules, which chemists have been doing for centuries, really, uh, decorated with geometric information on the relative position of the atoms. So if you look at these, then, uh, on top of uh, just uh, uh, representations uh, and architectures for point clouds, you have to consider that we are not trying to describe a track uh, on the highway, but we're trying to describe molecules. So there, is, uh, uh, there are physical requirements and constraints that are imposed on the relationship between a structure and its properties. And for example, uh, and this is something which is incredibly helpful from the point of view of machine learning, uh, the uh, relationship between uh, the configuration of atoms and uh, the, its properties computed at the quantum level is typically smooth, differentiable, meaning that you can compute derivatives, and it's usually very regular, meaning that you can find uh, a good approximation uh, with relatively low complexity and relatively low data requirements. Uh, Another requirement, which is kind of obvious, but I will actually speak quite a bit about this, um, is the requirement that the mapping is complete, or probably uh, in this audience I should be more precise and say injective. So if I have two molecules that are different, uh, I want to be able to predict that they have different properties. And what actually makes this requirement not so trivial is the fact that at the same time, we also require the mapping to be symmetry preserving. If I have the same molecule and I just rotate it rigidly in space or I change the labeling of the atoms, the energy is the same, it doesn't change. Uh, and so the, as I will show you that basically combining the symmetry requirement and the uh, completeness requirement is actually far from trivial. And other requirement, which is not a strong requirement, but it's actually sort of very much rooted in physics and very much useful in terms of getting transferable models, uh, is to build models that are additive. And what I mean here is that uh, we usually build the models for the properties of a big system as the sum of contributions from atom-centered environments. Okay, so this is not really, you know, that you just assume that the energy depends on the nature of the atoms, so the energy would depend on the nature of an atom and the local geometry up to a certain cutoff. And this is essential to make these models computationally efficient, and also it's essential to make these models data efficient, because if you try to approximate the function of the coordinates of 100,000 atoms, that's 
never going to fly. If you try to describe the energy of 100,000 atoms in terms of functions that only depends on the coordinates of 20 something atoms within a, a sphere around each atom, then this is a much more feasible proposition. So these physical requirements uh, uh, translate uh, into requirements on the functional form of the model. So for example, if uh, we want to build uh, a model for a property that is additive, uh, the property Y of a structure A will actually have to be written in models uh, that write it as a sum over uh, environments. When I write AI, what I mean is basically a bunch of atoms uh, centered around a central atom. Okay, and this basically, you know, links very naturally into a graph representation because now atoms are nodes and I only describe local neighborhoods in the graph. Uh, symmetry means that my models should be invariant or covariant, so uh, equivariant with respect to symmetry operations. And this is particularly painful when it comes to rotations. Okay, you want basically that if you are predicting a vector and you rotate the molecule, that you are predicting on, the vector should rotate together with the molecule. So the model should be built to be able to approximate only functions that are equivariant with respect to rotations. And of course, it should also be equivariant or invariant with respect to the labeling of the atoms. Okay? So we are basically requiring that a model fulfills all of these properties. Of course, there are many, many ways of doing this approximately. You can just do data augmentation, but there is a certain um, sort of uh, sociological reluctance in the modeling community to uh, have models that are not exactly symmetric. And the, there are good reasons for this, because in the past, uh, people have been burned very, very badly, you know, getting completely unphysical results, because when you have a small symmetry breaking, uh, it can actually lead to a macroscopic uh, phase transition, macroscopically different uh, changes in the properties of a system. So how do you build a model that is uh, uh, symmetric, uh, atom-centered, and equivariant? It actually turns out that you don't have that much freedom. So I'm trying here to, you know, I don't know how much this notation will be uh, repulsive to you, <laughs> but basically the idea, what I'm trying to say here is that basically, for example, I could say, well, I write the property of an environment A, I could approximate it as a function of uh, the coordinates of two neighbors of the central atom, and I make it uh, invariant to permutations by summing over all the possible uh, pairs of atoms. If I do this, uh, this will be a function that is invariant uh, to the order by which I provide the atoms. This is kind of a deep set uh, uh, architecture. Uh, and, but rather than writing this, uh, which basically would require me to sum over all the pairs of atoms, uh, I could equally well uh, write this uh, as a uh, integral of a function of two coordinates uh, with the uh, delta functions that select the position of the neighbors. And, and the interesting thing is that since basically these delta functions, you see, factor out, I can basically write this integral as a integral over, basically I can sum separately over the two neighbors and I can build the densities of the neighbors. And this basically mean that in practice, I can write a function that depends in a, a permutation invariant way on the coordinates of the neighbors by expanding the neighbor density twice, taking a tensor product, and then building a linear model in which this tensor product provides the descriptors. So this clearly generalizes, and if you, have, if you want to write a function that is in permutation invariant to new neighbors, you just need to stack a tensor products of densities and then uh, you can write a linear model that actually allows you to approximate, uh, you know, that basically spans uh, the, sp the space uh, of symmetric functions of one, two, three, four neighbors. But we, want, we don't only want uh, invariance to permutations, we also want invariance to rotations. And the way we are doing this uh, is basically by higher integration. We average uh, over the group uh, of uh, rotations, uh, proper or improper rotations, uh, and uh, what is nice is that basically when you translate these into this density uh, view, um, 
if you choose uh, a basis of spherical harmonics that are basically um, irreducible representations of the rotation group, uh, you can avoid having to do this integral over rotations explicitly, and you can basically cast the problem of building invariant or equivariant descriptors by selecting the appropriate combination of coefficients that has the right symmetry. And this I pictorially represent as basically this, you know, average over rotations of this tensor product of densities, which in practice is computed using this uh, uh, correlation. And this basically can be generalized to an equivariant framework. You can also learn vectors and tensors by exploiting uh, the, uh, pro the symmetry properties of the O3 group. And for those of you with the background in physics, all of the beautiful angular momentum algebra stuff comes back to life because everything that you have to do and everything that you can do is Klebsch-Gordon sums in which you take two angular momenta and you combine them with a Klebsch-Gordon coefficient. And so, yeah, I visually represent this as a projection of this symmetrized object onto one particular irrep of O3. So from the point of view of uh, modeling, uh, of materials modeling, uh, this is what is very nice about this framework is that it can be mapped uh, onto a long running tradition of expanding uh, uh, properties uh, of a molecule in terms of body ordered terms. So basically you say, okay, you know, the first uh, order approximation I can do is assume that the properties of my system only depends uh, on pairs of atoms. And my overall property will be the sum over all the pairs of these properties. And actually these uh, in this language really maps as onto a linear model uh, built uh, on these pair correlation functions. And if I want to go to more complex, I basically can write a function in terms of uh, uh, basically two distances and one angle. So triplets of atoms, which again maps uh, onto a linear model in these density correlation functions. And so basically you can map these traditional body ordered models onto this uh, hierarchy of descriptors. And what is nice is that basically you can uh, build uh, this hierarchy of descriptors uh, in a uh, iterative way. Basically you build the descriptors that give you information on pairs of atoms, then you combine them with a the klebsch gordon product and you get information on triplets of atoms, another combination you get the quadruplets of atoms, and so on and so forth. And the, and actually, I mean, uh, this, is, uh, this has been quite a long uh, running effort, but basically we have been able to show that also the vast majority of the equivariant models, uh, uh, tensor field networks, uh, E3NN, what they really do is just uh, compute automatically a slice uh, in this uh, space uh, of density correlation descriptors. And you, you can visualize what this is doing by basically saying, okay, I first expand a density. So now I'm describing just one neighbor. And, and then I decompose this density into uh, irreducible components with respect to rotations. And then if I want to go up in body order, I need to take another density and build all the tensor products. And I will get invariant terms, not only by combining invariant terms. If I take two vectors, and I take the sum of x1, x2, y1, y2, uh, z1, z2, that's also rotational invariant. And this is how these uh, properties of the O3 group come into play. So basically you can get invariant terms also by combining vectors, by combining L equal to terms and so on and so forth. And so, you know, you go on and the uh, number of features that you compute basically explodes. So what uh, practical models do is, uh, uh, since, you know, the, master, the majority of models actually aim to get invariant uh, properties, uh, what they do is, ooh, Okay, this should be a nice uh, shaded thing, but anyway, um, PDF rendering glitch. Uh, basically what models do is uh, stop at a certain body order, take the invariance, and then compute a nonlinear function with them. And you can see that what you do when you stop at a certain order and you uh, compute a nonlinear function, you basically uh, take a slice over the set of correlations that are built only using those 
invariants as the building blocks. So you don't, you are not spanning the full space of possible invariant uh, polynomials. And so if you want uh, actually to have a more complete description, you can, you have to go to a higher body order and then uh, uh, build invariants based on these higher body order terms. And basically the interesting question is, uh, can you stop and where? So uh, for example, can you just take distances uh, and use them to build a machine learning model? Is this a universal approximator? The answer is no. You can build the structures that have the same set of distances, but are different. And this is something which has been known and studied for a long time. And what is kind of surprising is that we thought that, you know, by going to three body descriptors, so since we have information on distances and angles, we had enough information to reconstruct the gram matrix. And so that should have been enough to have a complete description. And actually, uh, Sergey, PhD student in my lab, who back then was a master student, after a presentation came to me and told me, oh, I think that what you said about these descriptions being completely is wrong, I have a counterexample. And actually, he had a counterexample, a whole family of counterexamples, and we also could find counterexamples for four body features. So the problem with these degeneracies, these are basically pairs of structures that have exactly the same descriptors, which means that no matter how sophisticated is your model, it will never be able to predict the different properties of them. And the problem is that the, this degeneracy spills over also to neighboring structures because we are trying to get a smooth approximation. And if I pin two structures that should have a different energy, let's say, to have the same energy, I will also uh, damage uh, the, the smoothness and the regularity of uh, the approximator that I'm trying to build. So you might think that you can get away with this problem by going to graph convolutions, a different family of uh, descriptors. And so actually graph convolutions have been very successful in chemical modeling. Uh, and the first uh, generation of these methods basically used uh, only distances between atoms uh, um, to build a description and you might, uh, and, and then I probably don't need to explain to you how graph convolution work. You basically consider the multi-set of the neighbors and the distances and you sort of hash it somehow, build a unique function of these neighbor properties and you assign it as a label to each node and then you iterate this procedure. And, and actually you can map these uh, to this density correlation framework by basically using uh, the densities uh, on the neighbors as descriptors of the neighbors. But uh, is this a good idea? Well, you might think, uh, well, it is well known that graph convolutions uh, are not complete. There are counterexamples uh, and there's this weissweiler Lehman test uh, and you can build uh, graphs uh, that are not isomorphic uh, but are indistinguishable to a graph convolutional network. But actually, things for molecules are much better than these because you don't have just a graph. You have a graph decorated with distances. And if you consider, you know, if you increase the cutoff, basically, if you consider a fully connected graph, in practice, all the counterexamples that you knew about could be distinguished by a very simple graph convolutional network. However, Sergei is very stubborn, and so <laughs> he managed to come up with a counterexample that breaks uh, uh, graph convolutional networks decorated with distances, irrespective of how, even if you make the network fully connected, these counterexamples break uh, graph convolution based on distances. And you know, on a practical level, this means uh, that there is a hard limit to the accuracy that you can reach for molecules that are close to these degenerate point cloud configurations. So uh, luckily, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we managed, well, no, no, not really, a couple of weeks ago, we pushed on the archive, but we f managed to find a, a framework to obtain a complete description using only a finite order of correlation. Because of course, if you go to arbitrarily high order of correlation, sooner or later, you will become complete because you will basically span the full set of possible invariant polynomials. But we found a way to build uh, a complete descriptor based on a finite order of correlations. And the idea is that, okay, just let me remind you, the problem here is that we have these cluster sums, sums over neighbors or triplets and so on. 
and uh, we map these uh, to these uh, density correlations. And the problem that we have is that when you, you enforce symmetries, you can end up with structures that have the same histogram of distances, the same histograms of distances and angles. And so what we found is that what is key is the order by which you apply the symmetrization. So basically, if uh, we don't uh, do this uh, symmetrization over atoms, if we don't make the model entirely permutation invariant, uh, but we basically build something which is equivalent to a list of labeled the tetrahedra, this contains enough information to have a complete description. And after we have this complete description that is, however, not permutation invariant, what we do is basically apply a deep set idea. We apply a universal approximator to these uh, uh, labeled descriptors, uh, and only then sum over these two labeled atoms. And the practical effect of this is that uh, we get a model that can also distinguish these degenerate structures. So here, the red is a model that is built on a descriptor that is uh, incapable of distinguishing these pairs of structures. So basically, these two points uh, are two structures that are different, uh, have different energy, but are indistinguishable by these uh, descriptors. And so no matter, you, we, you know, here we use a deep uh, uh, architecture, but uh, the descriptors are the same. And so the predicted energy will be the same. And if instead we go through these uh, uh, local uh, descriptors that are not permutation invariant, build the model, and then symmetrize over permutations, uh, we basically get something that can uh, differentiate between the structures. And actually, it turns out being uh, much more efficient at learning altogether. So to sort of wrap up, uh, I think that particularly for those who are interested in geometric machine learning, uh, there is a lot of interesting uh, stuff uh, in actually fairly ancient uh, literature uh, on uh, uh, chemical modeling, because basically chemists have been dealing with point clouds uh, for at least uh, 60 years. Um, and uh, a lot of the ideas that uh, go in here are basically physical principles such as locality, symmetry, equivariance. Uh, and actually, there is an entire another talk that I could have made about non-local non uh, behavior. But I think that there are many problems outside of chemistry that can benefit uh, from having models that incorporate uh, these notions. Um, and I find kind of pleasing that a lot of the frameworks that are practically in use uh, can be understood uh, in the same uh, unifying uh, umbrella. And the reason why, basically, they can be unified uh, is that uh, uh, the requirement of symmetry ties your hands. So if you require symmetry, there aren't many ways you can take uh, all three equivariants and combine them to get another O3 equivariant. And so I was actually having a, a discussion with Rishi Condor, and he kind of admitted that basically whether you call uh, an equivariant neural network, a neural network, uh, or a polynomial approximation is more a matter for the marketing department than, than, than a scientific uh, distinction. Because the only thing you can do is effectively build a basis uh, in an efficient way, but you build a basis of uh, uh, rotation invariant polynomials. And so I hope that this can uh, kind of stimulate some discussion. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I have a question about your uh, you use the tensor product. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering. Well, when you use the tensor product, you show that you have permutation invariant or in, uh, equi equivalent. Mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering what's the purpose of tensor product for, in this research? It's only for to get such permutation invariant, or you can get enhanced representation. So tensor products. So if you take the full tensor product, you can show that you get, uh, I mean, provided that you discretize your density on a sufficiently rich basis, you get a complete linear basis to expand any uh, uh, symmetry adapted uh, function uh, of, the pro of the coordinates of n atoms. 
But this is uh, very expensive because basically you see the coefficients uh, in the combination uh, span, it's a full tensor. So something which I think is a very interesting question and something that we are thinking about and I uh, think it's something that could also get some uh, useful input from people here uh, is uh, uh, can you basically build a low rank approximation of this tensor? A lot of, uh, and this is what I was kind of implying here with this uh, plot that unfortunately is not as beautiful as it could be, <laughs> is that basically what uh, uh, practical implementations of these models do is take a slice, uh, a low rank, in this case, basically this is a low rank approximation, uh, but the specific approximation that is used in most cases uh, uh, completely uh, doesn't include some of the polynomial basis uh, that you need. And this is what leads to these uh, um, degeneracy problems. So it might be possible to build a smarter tensor contractions uh, that avoid this problem. Yeah, right. We usually assume the low rank approximation for the transformation and we get reduced dimensionality. Exactly. But yeah. the question is how to do it in a way that doesn't uh, give, that, that basically doesn't restrict uh, the approximating power of uh, the model too much. I mean, basically, we would like to have a contraction for which uh, Sergei cannot find a counterexample, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I have another question. Uh, do you think is any other possibility to do tensor product, not only like rank one, but more complicated like tensor network? Yes, uh, and basically this is already done in a way. Okay, mm -hmm. so basically you can basically when you choose to do the explicit iteration up to a certain body order, you are effectively building a higher rank tensor, and then you can feed this tensor into something else. But uh, there, is a, th there are many different ways to slice, uh, uh, something I'm not talking about today, but we have, uh, um, a, th there is another dimension that I have, I, I talk about uh, geometry, but you also have the chemical nature of the atoms, right? And this is another uh, discrete dimension. You have uh, 80 elements, uh, you know, 80 stable elements in the, in the, in the periodic table. Uh, so how to represent the correlations between 80 different elements and something that we're doing there is effectively a low rank uh, approximation of the correlations between these elements and it works beautifully. Okay, thank you. We will chat offline. Yes. Thank you for interesting talk. Uh, so I'm very new to this topic, so maybe it's not I say, a good question. But uh, how do you get uh, training data or training or um, data to uh, train these models? Yeah. So actually, it's, it, it, I think that this, this in general, this uh, area is uh, um, is kind of interesting. Uh, for I, I think it would be. I mean, in my opinion, it's something on which you guys should work more because it's. Uh, um, ba basically, you get the training data from electronic structure calculations, okay? So I think it's very interesting because uh, you have uh, targets that, you know, if you, if you only care about the machine learning problem and not about the fact that in the end you get something that corresponds to physical reality, you can, uh, um, you can assume your training data to be noise-free. There is no noise. And uh, you can, if you pick a cheap electronic structure method, you can generate billions of data points. Mm -hmm. But then that model will be garbage because the, uh, the reference electronic structure data is, very, is a very bad approximation of physical reality. And if you want instead to have a high quality target, then the electronic structure calculations that you need to run are very expensive. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very nice playground for machine learning because you can basically uh, you know, you can basically um, experiment with your models in a data-rich regime, knowing that at the end of the day, your objective is to be able to get accurate model also in the data-poor regime. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think it's an interesting uh, playground. For, for all of you. Okay, thank you very much. May, may I ask a question? Uh, I'm not sure my understanding is right or not. 
uh, it, it seems like one law of your task is to choose uh, practically the good body order. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so have you ever considered to learn the order from the data, data set use deep, deep neural networks? So, I mean, okay, first of all, you can regard the uh, body order, the maximum body order that you consider as, uh, uh, as a hyperparameter. And it's a discrete hyperparameter. And in practice, uh, uh, you hardly ever need to go beyond the body order five. Okay. So uh, the, I don't think there is really the need of something sophisticated to a problem. To, but, but what is uh, the, 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 the key point is that basically, when you build nonlinear functions, uh, oops, uh, when you build nonlinear functions uh, yes. of uh, your uh, low body order descriptors, uh, yeah. these implicitly incorporate uh, higher body order information. Okay. So, but, but the difficulty is that they don't incorporate all the higher body order information because there are some uh, uh, correlations that, are, that cannot be described. Okay. And so basically the question is how to build something that has a universal approximating power, even yes. though you can't just uh, throw uh, stuff into a transformer and say, I will get, uh, yeah. uh, I will be able at least in principle to approximate everything. Yes, thank you very much. Be because uh, I know some, some works uh, which can learn such, such a uh, the all order of the tensor pr products mm -hmm. uh, automatically, so they can give a good balance between the uh, ex expressive power and the mm -hmm. uh, practical concern. I think yes. I, I, I think that would be really useful uh, in, in this field. Really? But you know, often there is a sort of a translation difficulty yeah. in, uh, in adapting uh, methods. Uh, here, the big difficulty is that we are not uh, taking uh, just, these are symmetrized tensor products. So we basically need to take tensor products that are reprojected. Basically, our tensor products yes. are, are of this form. Okay. When yes. I take a tensor product, it's not just an outer product, but yes. they, they are combined with these coefficients. I see. Yes. Which okay, probably is not, I don't know if it's a big difficulty or not, but from a practical point of view. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite not sure, but maybe there's some methods can do with not all, only the tender product, but, but, but some, uh, for, for, for example, we can learn the order of the tensor network. Mm -hmm. Yes, by some uh, machine learning methods. Well, uh, to my knowledge, maybe it is po possible, but I'm not sure it works well for, for our problem. No, it, it might be, I, I, I'm convinced, it, I mean, it must be possible, but okay. uh, really in practical terms, uh, yeah. we cannot just take, uh, you know, some uh, uh, optimized in some kind of uh, okay. package uh, and apply it because we are not just taking a, uh, our combinations are symmetrized. Okay, yeah, thanks, thank you very much. So in the last slide, you, you have found geometric possibilities. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of my students at the University of Turkey talk, talk about you know, this direction in, in the language of category theory. Wow, well, I, I think Fair, yeah, yeah, this direction <laughs> is quite essential. So he, he really tried to uh, in, include symmetry and any kind of you know, invariance. And, in and I think that, you know, a lot of the general graph theoretical results uh, when you apply them to uh, 3D geometry, uh, you, you have a lot more structure. And this uh, structure helps you a lot. So, you know, it's, uh, it's very easy to build uh, a counter, uh, you know, a vice Fahler Lehman breaking graph, uh, but it's very hard to build uh, an actual 3D geometry that breaks the vice Fahler Lehman test. Uh, so it's, um, so I, I think that, you know, the intersection between uh, geometry and graphs, uh, is, it's a very interesting area, yeah. but, you know, I, I just simulate materials. Oh. <laughs> okay, so let's continue the discussion over coffee. So thank you very much.